Okay, so today we're finally going to get into engineering. Up until now, what we've been looking at has been mostly things that come out of a code. Um, you know, uh, what is the load? How do we make the load? Anyone can do it. It's not considered engineering so much. Maybe the engineers are better at it because we do it so often. This lecture is the start of engineering. So this is basically a summation of courses that engineers take. We do more complex versions of it, of course, but this is where you start to learn the process of engineering. So to do that, we have to introduce some concepts. And because we're talking about some things that some people might be uh, used to and comfortable with if you did physics, some of the concepts we're going to talk about you'll probably find pretty easy. For those that haven't, you might start to feel a little bit overwhelmed and a little bit intimidated, but what I want you to do is take a breath, look at the previous examples, try to break it down and do it step by step. Um, don't try to rush to the answer. Um, try to go through it and then maybe go through it a second time if you need to, to see if you get the same numbers. I am always going to show you a process or a procedure or a way to kind of repetitively do it so that you can be consistent. You know, when I was in engineering or when I was doing these courses, uh, you would go through and do it and you kind of, you'd go through it all again and again and again and again and you'd develop patterns. I'm going to tell you some of those patterns very close to the beginning so that you can see them right away. We also don't have the luxury of two full courses on this topic. So I'm giving you the Coles Notes, but we're only going to do Coles Notes level examples. So those can go hand in hand. You're going to get all the information you need to do all the work we need to do. So statics, we're breaking up into two lectures. This is part one, next week is part two. So I've tried to keep it very linear in this week's lecture. Today we're going to talk about forces and we're going to talk about vectors, equilibrium, and reactions. Next week, we're going to take that a step farther, and we're going to add in another type of vector, and we're going to talk about moment. You know, you've heard me talk about it a little bit. You've seen me write M down in some equations, but we're actually going to start calculating and working with moments next week. So what is statics? If this lecture is our statics lecture, and next week is the second part of the statics lecture, what is it? Well, the very technical, annoying version of it is the branch of mechanics that is concerned with the analysis of loads, force, and torque, or moment, on physical systems in static equilibrium, that is, in a state where the relative position of subsystems do not vary over time, or where components and structures are at a constant velocity. Basically, that shit stays still. That's what we care about. We want stuff to stay still. Stay still doesn't mean have some movement, which means deflection internally within it. We're talking about our system. We don't want our system to fly off into space or spin around in any way. So that's what we want. We want it to stay still. That's the goal. That's what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure these things stay still. For them to stay still, they have to be strong enough so that they don't break and move. So that's the idea here, is if it moves, it's broken, and we certainly don't want our buildings and the elements within our buildings to break. We don't want them to move. So that's the goal of everything we're going to calculate for the next couple of weeks. Don't worry about this slide too much. This is just to give you some background information on where this is coming from. So Newton's second law, force is the product of mass and acceleration. We've been working with this unit kilonewtons, um, but you don't, and I showed you what it means representatively, but this is just to give you a little bit of information on where it comes from, why we call it that. Obviously, you've got Newton with the apple bonking him on the head, of course. Uh, but this is where it comes from. It was, you know, you always talk about Newton and gravity and the apple. Well, gravity is really acceleration. So force is the product of mass and acceleration. So force equals m for mass, 
which is in kilograms, times A, which is acceleration, which is in the units meters per second squared. So that means force has a magnitude and a direction and can be represented by a vector. And this is going to be important because we're going to learn how to work with vectors. The common unit of force is a kilonewton, which is a thousand newtons. One newton is one kilogram meters per second squared. So the weight falling times acceleration, which we know on Earth we have a value for gravity acceleration on Earth. We're not going to worry about that too much, but we'll do a couple quick examples with it later in the lecture. But this is just to help you get your head around where this is coming from. So force will often draw as an arrow in the 3D or 2D world. You'll often also see we draw coordinates to help us understand what direction things work in. We're always going to work with up and down being y, upwards being positive, back and forth being uh, x, um, and so to the, well, you see me backwards, I think, so I don't want to point in any direction, uh, but um, to the right is positive and to the left is negative, and z is in and out of the page, where out of the page is positive and into the page is negative. So what are vectors? Vectors are really just a way for us to talk about um, units of measurement with direction. So we need, we need a magnitude or a value and we need a direction. It does not just have to be force. You can have vectors of distance. You can have vectors of uh, electricity. What are other moment? What other vectors can you think of? Velocity, acceleration, acceleration, energy, no. momentum. Mom well, I said moment. Momentum and moment. Yeah, I guess they're not the same. Electricity, I said. What else? There's more. I know there's yeah. more. Anyway, you can have all kinds of different units of measurement that you use vectors to represent. That's why I said if you did physics in university. This next lecture is going to be easy breezy for you because most of it you already know how to do. It might be a nice refresher for you. If you haven't done any physics in high school or university, you're going to need to stop and think about this. Maybe look these up on the internet, give yourself a refresher on vectors, uh, give yourself a, re uh, a refresher on basic physics principles because this is all built on that knowledge. So if we have a vector with a line on top, or if we have a value with a line on top, it represents a vector. So that means if we're not drawing an arrow, here's a good way to kind of talk about it. Sidebars indicate a magnitude with no associated direction. We don't like that. We always want to know direction. So we're not going to work with that very often. This is just refreshers on what these look like. If you see just the value with no lines or no sidebars, it indicates the magnitude of the vector. Direction must come from somewhere else. We need it a direction to have it be a vector. So often we'll draw it as an arrow. So if you see a value with an arrow, that's still a vector because the value is the magnitude and the arrow gives us our direction. If you see a subscript here, it, if it's in an X, Y, or Z, that means we're talking about something parallel to a principal axis. Remember, y is up and down, x is back and forth, and y and z is in and out of the page. So if you see the subscript of an x, y, or z, that's giving us the direction. You don't even have to think about it. The direction is set within that because we've, we know it's parallel to that axis. That's just a nice easy one. It's related to that axis. If you see uh, a vector with a subscript that's numbered, that implies that you have a bunch of vectors. So that's just to help you, you could call it Bob. It doesn't have to be a number. That could be Bob and Bill and Erica and Jane. It could be whatever you want, but often we'll keep it simple and doing one, two, three, and four, just to kind of help keep track of things. So if we have a bunch of vectors that maybe we need to add up, it might be helpful to know which vector we're talking about in any given moment. 
So I said adding vectors. Yes, we are going to add vectors up. Now, here is the thing that is going to help you the most. Graphically, there is a pretty quick way to add up vectors. And in fact, sometimes if I'm feeling lazy and don't feel like whipping out my calculator, I might open CAD and draw it to scale in CAD and actually take off dimensions from it. I'm also going to teach you how to calculate it using a calculator. Do not worry about that. I will give you all the means. But what I like about this is it's a good self-check. Before you write down any numbers, this method is very handy for you to just double check that the number you calculate matches what you think should happen. So adding vectors graphically is something that we call tip to tail. So we sum all of the vectors up by drawing from the first tail to the final tip. I always think it should be called tail to tip rather than tip to tail. It bugs me a little bit. But here's what I'm talking about. We have force one. Here's the tail, here's the tip. We have force two. We've connected the tail of force two to the tip of force one. We've got force three. We've connected its tail to the tip of force two. Here's the tip of force three. Oh, look, we have the fourth, fourth one. So we've got the tail of force, force four connected to the tip of force three. And then here's the tip of force four. Well, tip to tail means if we start with our tail at the same spot here, our tip needs to finish at the same spot here. So really we're saying that summing force one, two, three, and four, giving us a total force is the same as starting here and ending here. So adding up all of these is the equivalent to this. It is not always a linear process. If they're all in the same direction, no problem. Addition is easy. If we had an F1 here and an F2 here and an F3 here, easy. Basic addition mathematically will work. But when they're going in different directions, mathematically it gets a little more complicated. That's why taking the time to just draw this little diagram can help you out quite a bit. It will give you pretty darn close, and if you draw it roughly to scale, you'll have a pretty good representation of the answer. Like I said, sometimes I'll do it in AutoCAD, which draws things very precisely to scale. We can break vectors up. So we can add them up using tip to tail. We can break them down using tip to tail. Now, often, I said if you have them all in the same plane, it's very easy to add up. We like to work in a relatively boring world where we like things against major axes or that principal axes of x, y, and z I talked about. So we can break them down however we want, but often it's going to be handy for us to break it down in x and y and z coordinates. So if we had... That was a weird noise. Uh, if we have this force here, F, it might be handy for us at some point to break it down into X and Y coordinates. And we can do that using that same tip to tail method. I should have a force along the X that comes along here and along the Y that comes up to here. So parallel to major axes, I should have something like that. Let's see. Force X, force Y. So I could have called this force one and force two. That's totally okay. Uh, but since I'm breaking it down into X and Y, I thought I'd call them parallel to the X axis and parallel to the Y axis. Why not call them X and Y? It means that maybe I can linearly add it up with something else later. So look, still tip to tail. We've drawn the tip to tail method of these arrows. So the resultant of them, the adding them up, is still this force here. We've just broken it down into its x and y coordinates. Now, for those of you that love a right angle, same as me, what have we got here? This turns into a right angle for us. So we know that we have all kinds of handy tricks for doing things with right angles. There's a basic trig that's not the really complicated weird stuff, but basic trig, basic equations that we learn in junior high 
that we can make use of if we break things down into its X and Y components, giving us a handy dandy right angle here. So essentially what we've said with this is force X plus force Y equals our total force. I wonder what the next rule is. Pythagorean's theorem. All right, here we go. This is basically just what we already know about right angle triangles. If we want to add up force X and force Y. We know it's not linear. We know it is that handy rule square root, square root of the sum of the squares. So squaring FX plus squaring FY equals the square of F. So if we know any two sides, we can break it up into its components. If we knew fx and fy, for example, we could figure out what the resultant force is here. So the square root of fx squared plus fy squared is our total force f. So that's the summation of our x and y components. If you guys remember, right angle triangles have another handy dandy rule, our sine cosine tangent laws. So if we have an angle here, this is the opposite side, and this is the adjacent side, and this is the hypotenuse. So the sine of the angle equals opposite over hypotenuse. The cosine of the angle equals adjacent over hypotenuse, and the tangent of the angle equals opposite over adjacent. This is why back in week one, I made you go over this. It's because it's gonna be very handy to be able to do this quickly because we're gonna, in two weeks, do this, I don't know, 30, 40 times when we analyze trusses. It's not gonna be complicated math because as you do it, after you do it the fifth time, it gets pretty easy, but we're gonna to need to be able to do it quickly. So it's handy to just have that as a refresher in our brain here. We can do this in uh, 3D as well. So, so far we've only talked about X and Y. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to make you solve too many things in a 3D environment. In fact, it's very handy to be able to take 3D and flatten it and work in 2D. And that's what we're going to strive to do the majority of the time. But just to show you, we can do it in 3D. If we add in the Z component to our axis system, so I've drawn this arrow here, but really we can't get a sense of the size of it. Is it almost coming out completely out into the page? We don't know. So this is where maybe drawing something or looking at our X, Y, and Z components could be handy. We could draw this tip to tail in a 3D world if we wanted, but we've got FX, FY, and FZ equal our total force F, or Fx with a hat, telling us it's a vector, that we can't add these up linearly, uh, Fy with a hat, Fz with a hat equals our total force with a hat, or Fx squared plus Fy squared plus Fz squared equals F squared. So uh, non-orthogonal components. So if, ten, if we wanted to add up things, that weren't on X and Y axes. What do we do then? If we have some funny shaped uh, uh, forces, how do we add up force one and force two? Well, we know we can do tip to tail. We know that we can draw starting here and ending here, and that that's pretty much our total force. If we had drawn this perfectly to scale, which you can do, you can get the number. But you should practice doing this with numbers with a calculator because we're going to start doing so many of them pretty soon that you're going to need to be able to do it quickly and I don't want you to only do it graphically to find out you didn't take the time to learn how to do it numerically. So let's take a look. We know graphically we could have drawn it from there to there but we can take F1 and break it down into F1x and F1y. So that's still just breaking it down into its components. F2, we can break down into F2X and F2Y as well. 
Well, now look, now we have some things linearly on the same plane. We know that if everything is going in the same direction, we can just add it up. It gets really easy. So we can add up f1x and f2x, and we can add up f1y and f2y, because those are going in the same direction. So if we add up um, f1x and f2y, so look here, f1x and that component there is f2x. This component here is f1y, and this component here is f2y. We've got our total fx and our total fy. It's still the same total value. But now, if we break f1 into x and y, we break f2 into x and y, we can add up all our x's, we can add up all our y's, and then we can mathematically calculate the total value. So here it is broken out. We broke, so then we, so then we uh, break f1x, and we add up f2x, and we get a total fx. f1y and f2y, we get a total fy. And then the square of those equals our total force squared. We're going to do examples of this, so don't worry. Let's take this set of vectors here and add them up. We want to know the total vector here. They've given us their angle relative to different axes. So F1 is angled off the x-axis. F3 is angled off the x-axis. And Fy, they've given us an angle, or F2, they've given us an angle off the y-axis. I'm going to tell you, I hate having things off of anything but the x-axis, simply because what is your, uh, your governing angle or the angle you're using? Remember, sine, cosine, tan tangent, opposite, and adjacent become really important in the play here. If I keep everything referenced off of the x-axis, I find it a lot easier to just be able to continually use sine and cosine and tangent the same way. You can do it however you want, but I'm going to tell you, hot tip, it's going to be easier if you always stop and think about all of these vectors related to the x-axis. I said everything going to the right of the page is positive, and everything going to the left of the page is negative, because we're talking about a point right here. So anything pushing in one direction is positive, and anything pushing it in the other direction is going to be negative. And so this F2, we're probably going to want to not think about it relative to the y-axis, but relative to the x-axis. And we'll come to that. But before we do any math, let's draw ourselves a little diagram and see what our tip-to-tail looks like. And then when we do the math, we'll be able to check and see if that shakes out to what we expected to see. So let's do tip-to-tail. We've got F1, F2, and F3 drawn here. There's our total vector, or our total value. So let's go see what our units were. Ugh. Meters. This one is not forces. This is a distance vector, not a force vector. We're going to be pretty much only working with force vectors, but it's handy to know that these rules apply no matter what value of vector you're talking about. We can do it with meters here. So we've done our tip to tail check and it works. Now this is where people always say to me, how did you know what order to draw those in? Why, what if you hadn't called them F1, F2, and F3? What if you called them something else? Here's the best part. It doesn't matter what order you draw them in. The value is the same. I always say people say, get, tell me, you're crazy. There's no way that's true and I tell them to draw it out again and again. So, this was one order to draw them in. Let's draw them in a different order. Still, I literally copy and pasted these arrows and just placed them in a different order, still doing tip to tail. Look at that. That green arrow is exactly the same. Let's draw it in another order. Green arrow, exactly the same. So we can see that no matter what order we draw these in, our green arrow stays the same. 
So let's do this mathematically now. Let's go through this problem and break it down. So we have our three vectors. We have our vector of uh, F1 is 10 meters, and it is 22.5 degrees off of the x-axis. We have F2, which is 5 meters, and it is 22.5 degrees off of the y-axis. And we have F3, which is 7.5 meters off, and it is 45 degrees off of the x-axis. So let's break these down and sum these vectors up. We want to find the total distance. This one happens to be distance, but the principle behind vectors works no matter what. So let's go through and start breaking this down. Let's break up F1 into F1x and F1y. So we have a, a dot here, just to give us a reference point of what we're drawing from. And we have this force here of F, and we know that it is 22.5 degrees off of the x-axis. This is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. Everything going in this direction is positive and anything going in that direction is positive. Anything going down would be negative and anything going in that direction would be negative. We want to break this, which equals 10 meters, into x and y components. Well, if you guys remember, Sakatoa, the sine of the angle equals the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. The cosine of the angle equals the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. And the tangent of the angle equals the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. I wonder if that's just a little bit better. Yeah. Oh, no, that just changed the lighting. My, it's my black sweater seems to be the problem. I don't normally wear the black sweater when I'm doing this. Maybe that'll help. Although I'm wearing burgundy, I don't know if it's that much better. Oh, yeah, seems to be quite a bit better. Okay, so let's break. We know what we're really looking for is... F1x... and F1y. We can break it up. Uh, we know we can draw it tip to tail and that this, these two summed up must equal that. So tip to tail, we know that this is what it roughly looks like. And so this is where it's handy to have in your head what you expect to see. Uh, F1, or F, does the X component seem to be bigger or smaller than the Y component? It looks to me like my X component should be much higher than my Y component. Somewhere more than double, I guess. Um, but in that range, something like that. Well, we know that we have Sakatoa here. And if this is our angle of 22.5 degrees, this is our opposite side, this is our adjacent side, and this is our hypotenuse. So we have an angle and a hypotenuse as known values. We can use the opposite side, or sine, to find F1y, and the adjacent side, cosine, we can use the cosine rule to find the adjacent side. Or what we're saying is the sine of the angle, is that which angle this one is? Yeah. The sine of the angle equals the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse, or F1y divided by F1. And the cosine of the angle equals 
F1x, or the adjacent side, divided by the hypotenuse, which is F1. We know that the angle is 22.2 degrees, and we know that uh, F1 is 10 meters. These are the values we lo we're looking for. I'll often rewrite it just so that I can see it at a glance. So FY1 equals F1 times the sine of the angle, and F1x equals F1 times the cosine of the angle. We have these values, so we can find F1y and F1x. F1x equals F1, which is 10 meters, times the sine of the angle, which is 22.5 degrees. And F1y equals 10 times the cosine of, or sorry, I wrote that backwards. That should be y, and that should be x. So F1y is 10 times the sine of the angle, and F1x is F1 times the cosine of the angle. Let's plug this into our calculator, and this is where, please make sure your calculator is in degrees, not radians. We'll have 10 times the sine of 22.5 degrees gives us 3.83 meters. And F1x is 10 times the cosine of 22.5 degrees, or 9.24 meters. So F1x is 9.24 meters, and F1y is 3.83 meters. That looks like what we expected. F1x is a little more than twice the size of F1y. These calculations match what I graphically expected there. I am really cold now that I took my sweater off. I'm just going to turn the heat up in my house. Um, uh, so we figured out the first of our force breakdowns. We have two more we have to do. Let's break F2 into F2x and F2y. You can see with all of these subscripts, it starts to be pretty important to keep track of things and write things clearly. I'm going to try to do my best to be very explicit about these things to give you a pattern to follow with this. So this one, if this is our y-axis, and this is our x-axis, this is uh, y-positive, and this is x-positive, we've got a force F2, or not a force, we have uh, a vector F2 that is 5 meters. And we know that the angle here, which they gave us as gamma, is 22.5 degrees from the y axis. We know that we can break this into its x and y components. This should be F2y. And this is going to be F2x. So graphically, we can see that F2y should be somewhere around twice as big as F2x. So that gives us some context when we start to go through the math here. Now here's the thing. I'm going to show you two ways to do this. I always like to do everything referenced off of the x-axis. That makes it very handy when we start to get into trusses later on. But first I'm going to do it referenced off of the y-axis, just to show you that it doesn't matter what way you do it. 
but then we're going to consistently do it referenced off of the x-axis off after this. So let's do it um, from the y-axis. So we have our opposite side is f2x and our adjacent side is f2y. Opposite is sine or the sine of our angle equals f2x divided by our hypotenuse of f2. The adjacent side is f2y or cos of our angle is f2y divided by f2. Look, up here in this example, the y value is associated with sine, and here it's the x value. This is why I always like to do everything referenced off the x-axis, because then I will always have sine and cosine being relative to the same axes. This way, they're different. And not that there's anything wrong with that, it's easy enough to do the math, but it gets a one step easier if you don't have to think about that. If you always do your angles reference to the x-axis, it's going to be one step easier. You're not going to have to stop and figure this out every single time. But let's go through and do it. We'll do it both ways so that we can see. So let's rearrange this. This is f2x equals f2 sine our angle and f2y equals f2 times the cosine of our angle. Let's calculate f2x. f2x is f2, which is 5 meters, times the sine of our angle, which is 22.5 degrees, and f2y is our hypotenuse, or our our, our, our main vector, which is 5, times the cosine of our angle. We can plug this into our calculator. 5 times the sine of 22.5 is 1.91 meters, and 5 times the cosine of 22.5 is 4.62 meters. Let's do it from the y axis, from the x axis. What we're essentially saying is that instead of drawing it this way, we want to draw it. It's the same original vector. We've got f2x f2y this is f2 equals 5 meters but instead of this angle being 22.5 we're going to use this angle here this is a right angle, so it's got to be 90 degrees. That whole amount is 90 degrees. So we want gamma prime. Gamma prime equals 90 degrees minus 22.5 degrees. Or gamma prime equals 90 minus 22.5 equals 67.5 degrees. We're basically repeating what we did right here. It seems like we're making it more complicated. Why are you wasting our time, Shannon? This was quick. Now we have to redraw something. It's going to get more complicated. But here's why I like it. Now this is our triangle, and this is our important angle. We have our hypotenuse, we have our opposite side, and we have our adjacent. Opposite side uses sine adjacent side with a hypotenuse uses cosine. That now it's the same 
as this right here. We're just changing the value and the angle. We're not switching which sine and cosine goes with what force in each value. And that's going to be handy because then we don't even have to think. We can get into a pattern of writing it the same way. So we're saying if this is our angle, our opposite side, and our hypotenuse, we need to use sine. Uh, so we're saying that the sine of our angle is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, or F2y divided by F2. So up here, our y value was associated with sine, and now here our y value is associated with sine. It's just going to make our lives a tiny little bit easier. And the cosine of our angle is related to the adjacent side with hypotenuse. So we have F2x divided by F2, or F2y equals F2 times the sine of our angle, and F2x equals F2 times the cosine of our angle. We can calculate this out, and we better, for darn to ensure, get the exact same answers. So F2y equals F2, which is 5 meters, times the sine of our angle, which is 67.5 degrees, and F2x is equal to our vector of 5 meters times the cosine of 67.5 degrees. Let's plug this into our calculator. 5 times the sine of 67.5 equals 4.62 meters. F2y, F2y, 4.62 meters. 5 times the cosine of 67.5, 1.9, sorry, 91 meters. F2x, 1.91 meters. F2x, 1.91 meters. So I am going to strongly recommend that you always do it using your angle relative to your x-axis. It's going to start to make life just a little bit easier. Let's look at F3 now. Let's break F3 into F3x and F3y. So we have, let's imagine a little dot right here with a force or a vector like this. And for this one, they gave us a vector value of F3 equals 7.5 meters. They have told us that this vector is relative to the x-axis with an angle of 45 degrees. We want to break this up into its x and y components. So this should be F3x and this is F3y. So let's break this up. Now some of you are already probably saying to yourself, but Shannon, that one's going in the other direction. You're very much right. Let's think about that when we start to add everything up. Let's just ignore that for now and break this down into its value. We have an arrow showing us that it's going in that direction. So we have a visual on our magnitude. So let's break this up and we are already relative to the x-axis. So we know that our y value is going to use the sine equation and our x value is going to use the cosine equation. But we'll go through it again here. So this is our angle. This is the opposite side. This is the adjacent side. And that's the hypotenuse side. Now some of you probably also remember when it's a 45 degree angle, some things get a little bit easier. But let's go through the process anyway. We want to know what F3y is. It's the opposite 
the side opposite our angle, and we know our hypotenuse, so that means we should probably use our sine equation. So the sine of the angle equals the opposite, which is F3y, divided by the hypotenuse, which is F3. And the adjacent side makes use of cosine of the angle equals the adjacent side, which is F3x, divided by the hypotenuse, which is F3. We might as well just rewrite these here. F3y is F3 times the sine of our angle, and F3x is F3 times the cosine of our angle. So we can uh, fill these in with some numbers. F3y equals F3 is 7.5 meters times the sine of 45 degrees, and F3x equals our vector of 7.5 meters times the cosine of 45 degrees. Let's plug these into our calculator. 7.5 times the sine of 45 degrees equals 5.30 meters. 7.5 times the cosine of 45 degrees oh, is also 5.3 meters. So a 45 degree angle means that uh, these two sides are the same magnitude. They're going in different directions, but they have the same magnitude. What they asked us to do was to sum up all of these forces. Now, if you guys don't know your Greek, your basic Greek um, symbols for mathematics, that symbol here means sum. Sometimes there's the two little lines on it, but that means sum. And we want to sum up all of the values in X and all of the values in Y. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Let's sum up the forces in the Y direction. What do those equal? Well, I'm also going to draw us a little picture here. So in the y direction, we had our F1y going up like this. Actually, maybe I won't because they're already drawn here. F1y going up like this, and it was 3.83. We have F2y coming up with a value of 4.62. And we have F3y going upwards with a value of 5.3. That seems pretty easy. They're all going in the same direction. They're all going upwards, in fact, which we've said is the positive direction. So we have the summing of the forces of, in the y direction. Our very first one is our F1y plus F2y plus F3y. Or we have 3.83 upwards plus F2y is 4.62 meters upwards and F3y is 5.3 meters upwards. Let's add those up. We've got 3.83 plus 4.62 oops plus 5.3 equals 13.75 meters. Let's add up everything in the x direction. So we know it's going to be F1x plus F2x plus F3x. So let's take a look at those. F1x is 9.24, and here's our little arrow. It's going in that direction. We know everything in that direction is positive because that's what we've decided in the world. We've said everything up is positive and everything to the right is positive. So 
So that means everything down is negative and anything to the left is negative. In our y direction, everything was going up, so it was no problem. So we have f1x going in this direction, which is positive, and it has a value of 9.24 meters. Our f2x right here, we have our purple arrow going in this direction with a value of 1.91. So 1.91 meters in that direction, which is positive. And then we have f3x. So down here, f3x is in this direction. We have something going in the negative direction. If that direction is positive, this direction is negative. We have a value of 5.3, but we know it's going in the negative direction. So, so we, we can, can add these up. We have 9.24 plus 1.91 minus 5.3 gives us 5.85 meters. So we now have a pretty good summation of all of our vectors in the x and y direction. We broke down all three vectors and then summed up all of the x direction and summed up all of the y direction. Let's give ourselves a little drawing of that. Well, we, we see that it is 13.75 in the y direction. So that is Fy is 13.75 meters. And we have something in the x direction, which is Fx is 5.85 meters. We know we want the sum of these for something that looks like that. We want our total vector f. And we want to know what it is relative to that axis. So maybe that is a pain in the ass way to draw it. Maybe I should draw it again. Let's draw this again. I'm going to draw 5.85 meters here. And I'm going to draw, it's roughly to scale, it's not perfect, you could draw it perfectly to scale if you want it, is 13.75 meters. And here is the force F that I want. That's what I want to figure out right here. Well, we've got, and I want to know where it is in space. So I need its magnitude and I need its direction. The angle will give me the direction. Well, value pretty easy. We've got these two sides. It's a right angle triangle. F equals the square root of each side squared. So 5.85 squared plus 13.75 squared equals. We've got 5.85 squared plus 13.75 squared. And then we want the square root of that. That gives us 14.94 meters. So we have the magnitude of this vector. Now we need to know its direction. Well, we know the opposite side of this angle, and we know the adjacent side of this angle opposite over adjacent, well that is tangent of an angle equals opposite over adjacent or 13.75 divided by 5.85. What we're really saying is the angle equals tangent to the minus 1 of 13.75 divided by 5.85. We can plug that into our calculator. Again, double checking that we're in degrees. We want the inverse tangent, or the tangent to the minus 1, of 
13.75 divided by 5.85, and we get 66.95 degrees. So we now know that the value or the magnitude of this vector right here is 14.94 meters, and we know that this angle right here is 66.95 degrees. So we're able to start with three vectors, break them down into their x and y components, sum those up because it's a lot easier to sum them up when they're in the same direction, and then we can use right angle triangles again to figure out the sum of the, the x and y components. So here it is drawn roughly to scale. And here it is worked out again if you want to go back and look through it. So now that we know how to break vectors down and add them up and then break them down and then add them up and then find out a total, let's talk about what equilibrium means. So statics means we don't want things to move around. Well, equilibrium if it's not moving and there's forces being applied to it, how is that the case? If you take a ball and push on it, what happens to the ball? It moves. What if our ball isn't moving when a load is applied to it, and we know we have loads applied to our buildings, but we don't want them to move, what is stopping them from moving? So. Each structure is subjected to a series of loads that try and move the structure, such as self-weight, live, winds, earthquake, whatever. We want the structure to not move or remain in static equilibrium. To remain in equilibrium, there must be something stopping it from moving, or an equal and opposite force keeping it in its place. We call that equal and opposite force a reaction. So if we have this force pushing on this object right here, and they tell us that this is in static equilibrium, we know something's moving, because this wants to try to move. We want the sum of all of these forces to be zero. We've got a force applied to it, um, but we want the sum. Remember, this little image right here means sum. This little Greek symbol means sum. Uh, we want it to be zero. We don't want it to move. We want it to be like nothing is acting on it. But we have something acting on it. So, F1 plus some unknown thing has to equal zero. Or F1 has to equal a negative value that equals itself. Or an equal and opposite reaction. So we need this arrow in the exact opposite direction of the exact same value to stop this object from moving. For us, not sinking down into the floor, the floor is pushing up with a reaction. So that means there's a load acting on that floor, but the floor is pushing back with a reaction. So at our feet, we would have a reaction pushing up. We're also not sliding across the floor. So there's a reaction stopping us from sliding across the floor. If there's no force pushing on us, that value is going to be zero. So that's pretty easy. What slides do I need to stop at? OK, so uh, let's take a look at how we can talk about reactions. Because there's two ways we can figure out what the reaction is. If we have F1 and F2, we can solve for the reaction. We know we can sum up F1 and F2. So the total force F is going to be F1 squared plus F2 squared, and then take the square root of it to find our value F. So we have F2 and F1 drawn tip to tail, giving us F1 plus F2, or our total force. So we've got a total force here that we've just calculated the value for, if we knew what these values were. And we want the sum of all of the forces acting on this to be zero. So F1 plus F2 
has to have an equal and opposite reaction. The value of R has to be equal to the value of F1 plus F2, but it's got to be going in the opposite direction. So there's our reaction. So we can sum up our forces and then find the reaction. That is one way to do it. We can do it a second way. We can uh, find the reactions of F1 and F2 if we wanted, um, and then sum the reactions of Rx and Ry to find the total reaction. We know that this thing isn't sliding in this direction, so there must be an equal and opposite force pushing against it. We know this object isn't falling down to the ground, so there must be an equal and opposite reaction in the y direction that stops it from moving. So R1 in the y direction is counteracting F1. R2 in the x direction is counteracting F2. So F1 plus R1, we want it to equal 0. F1 equals the negative of R1. F2 equals the negative of R2. So R2 is acting in an equal and opposite direction. And then we can take the square root of the sum of the squares of R1 and R2 and find our total reaction. Our, the total value R here is the same whatever way we do it. So you can, um, you can sum things and then find the reaction, or you can find individual reactions and then sum it up for the reaction. Both ways are valid to go about doing it. Let's take a look at this problem where we have nothing parallel to a, uh, a principal axis here. So what could we do? Well, we can draw things tip to tail and we can draw our total reaction or our total force. And then we know we have to have an equal and opposite reaction and get a total value here. We could also break F3 into F3x and F3y, F2 into F3x and F2y, and we could break F1 into F1x and F1y. We could sum those all up. We could then, uh, we could either sum them all up and find the total force on it and then find the reaction, or we could sum up all the x's and all the y's uh, and then find the equal and opposite reactions for those, and then find the total reaction. So it's up to us what order we want to do it. But you can see that it'll work graphically for you as well. That previous example that we did, when we found that the sum of all of those forces equaled 14 point, not forces, all of those distances equaled 14.94 meters, had an an angle or a, a direction of 67 degrees off of the x-axis, so we have a magnitude and a direction, we can find the reaction. It's got to be equal and opposite, so it's going to be 14.94 meters in the opposite direction with uh, 67 degrees off of the x-axis, so equal and opposite forces. So let's find the reaction required to keep this dot in equilibrium. Just a refresher, up is y, right is, up is y positive, down is y negative, right is x positive, left is x negative. Let's figure out what the sum of these two forces is and the reaction required to keep this system in equilibrium. So let's do that mathematically now. So our, uh, our, our vectors are in kilonewtons, so they're forces. Uh, and we want to know what reaction is required to keep the system in equilibrium here. So we're going to break it down into x and y components and then figure out what it takes to keep this thing in equilibrium. Or to make sure that the sum of the forces in that direction equals zero. So we need to uh, start by breaking this up into x and y components. We have um, a force that they, we've drawn in blue uh, of 2 kilonewtons, and it is 70 degrees from the x-axis. We have F2 of 5 kilonewtons, 
and it is showing 120 degrees from the x-axis. But it's showing from the x-axis over here. We're never going to get any right angles with that. So it'll probably be easier for us if we refer to this from the x-axis over here. So let's take a look. Let's redraw this. Like I say, I always like to kind of write out my problem um, so that I can see it handily. If we were doing this on the screen, we'd be able to go back and look at it. So let's just draw it for ourselves here. We have our x-axis here where this is x positive and this is x negative. And we have two forces acting on this. We have a vector F1 of two kilonewtons and it is 70 degrees from the x-axis. Here's our our y-axis, where that's y positive. And we've got F2 which is 5 kilonewtons. And they've shown us that it's 120 degrees from this side over here but we know that we probably want to talk about it like this, or gamma prime is going to be 180 minus 120, because a straight line, that's 180 degrees all the way around, and this was 120, so we've got 60 degrees here. We know that we could probably draw ourselves a little picture here, of, um, I'm going to draw it a little bit smaller, something in the tip to tail range of this, which means we should end up with reaction equal and opposite, something like that. That's what we want to find. We want to find that reaction. Now this is just a rough image of it. Clearly it's not drawn to scale. This is just to give me a sense that there's probably something kind of going in that direction there based on my tip to tail and then an equal and opposite reaction that stops this object from moving. We want to know what it takes for this little dot, imaginary dot that we don't even know what it is, from moving. So let's break up F1 into X and Y coordinates. We've got our force F1 equals 2 kilonewtons and we want to break it up into F1y and F1x. We've drawn it tip to tail here so F1y is going down, F1x is going in that direction we now know, based on Sakatoa, which we've done a few times, that sine of the angle is opposite divided by hypotenuse. Cosine of the angle is the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. And tangent of the angle is opposite divided by adjacent. The angle we're talking about is right here, and it is 70 degrees. So we want to figure out what F1y is, and we know that it is going to be F1 sine our angle. We've written this out a few times. We did that in the last example where we went through and wrote it out step by step, but we've gotten pretty good at it. We know as long as we're always referencing from the x-axis, that will use the sine of the angle with the y component. And that y component, or that opposite side, is the hypotenuse times the sine of the angle. Or 2 kilonewtons times the sine of 70 degrees. And F1x is going to be F1 
times the cosine of the angle, or 2 times the cosine of 70 degrees. So we can calculate these now. We've got 2 times the sine of 70 degrees, or 1.8 8 kilonewtons. And this one is 2 times the cos of 70, or 0 0.68 kilonewtons. Now let's just take a second here. Let's keep it in our heads what direction these are going. I always like to draw myself some little arrows here and then maybe talk about what's positive and negative. This F1Y is pointing downwards. Is that positive or negative? So it's going downwards. Is that positive or negative? Well, we know everything upwards is positive, so that means this must be one point eight eight kilonewtons going downward is the same as negative one point eight eight kilonewtons. Our F one X component. We know that anything going in that direction is positive, and this is going in this direction. <coughs> Excuse me. So it must be negative as well, or minus 0.68 kilonewtons. Let's break up our F2 component. Let's write it here for ourselves. We're going to break up F2 now. We've got an F2 value that looks something like this. And we want to know F2y and F2x. So this was F2 and the value was 5 kilonewtons. And we've already figured out what this angle here is. We know that it's our gamma prime equals 60 degrees. They gave us this referenced all the way from the x-axis over here. But that's a bit of a pain because it doesn't really give us a right angle to work with. But now we've got a right angle here. We've got our opposite side and we've got our adjacent side and we've got our hypotenuse. And that's the angle that we're talking about. So we know that we can break this up into our x and y components, or F1y, or F2y equals F2 times the sine of our angle, or 5, is it 5? 5 times the sine of 60 degrees. And F2x is going to be F2 times the cosine of our angle, or 5 times the cosine of 60 degrees. We've got 5 times the sine of 60 degrees is 4.33 kilonewtons, and this is 5 times the cosine of 60 degrees, or 2.5 kilonewtons. Let's just take a look at what direction these are going. Our F2y component is pointing downwards. Yeah, that's right, that's negative. So we could call it minus 4.33 kilonewtons if we want it. And this one is going in the positive direction. F2x is going in that direction, or 2.5 kilonewtons in the x direction. So we've broken this up. Let's see what we get for the reactions here. Let's sum up the forces in the x direction, and let's sum up the forces in the y direction. We're going to do this two different ways. First, we're going to do it by summing up our x and y directions and then finding the reaction. And then we're going to do it another way where we start to find the reactions directly from this point right here. So let's do, let's do method one. 
So we're going to sum the forces in the y direction. So let's take a look at what forces we have. Now here's a good spot where I like to point out, I always like to remind myself what is positive and what is negative. We're saying that everything upwards is positive. So an upward arrow with a positive and we're summing all the forces in the y direction. Well, our F1y was downward. We've already figured out that that's minus 1.88. It was going downwards, which is the negative direction. And our F2y component was also going downwards, or minus 4.33. We can sum those up. We have negative 1.88 minus 4.33, and we have minus 6.21 kilonewtons. Or we're really saying we have 6.21 kilonewtons downwards. These two things are equal. Let's sum the forces in the x direction. Everything going in that direction is positive. So our F1x we calculated to be going in that direction, or 0.68 in that direction, minus 0.68 kilonewtons. F2x was going in that direction, or positive 2.5 kilonewtons. Let's add those up. We've got minus 0.68 plus 2.5 equals a positive 1.82 kilonewtons or 1.82 kilonewtons in that direction. We can draw this for ourselves now if we want. We have our, uh, our Fy component of 6.21 going downwards, and then, so this was Fy equals 6.21, and this is Fx equals 1.82. We can do our tip to tail, and we can get our applied, well, our applied force, F that we want to figure out. We want to know its magnitude and its direction relative to the x-axis. Well, we've got right angles here, and we've got Pythagorean's theorem. So, f equals the square root of 6.21 squared plus 1.82 squared. So, the square root of 6.21 squared plus 1.82 squared and we end up with 6.47 kilonewtons. So that's our magnitude, and the angle will tell us the direction. An angle we've got opposite and adjacent here. So our angle is tangent to the negative one of opposite over adjacent, or 6.21 divided by 1.82. We can calculate our angle there. It's the inverse tangent of 6.21 divided by 1.82. And we get 73.67 degrees. Let's take a look what that means for us. We've got a force like this of 6.47 kilonewtons and it is 73.67 degrees from the x-axis. We need an equal and opposite reaction of 6.47 kilonewtons That is 73.67 degrees from the x-axis, so equal and opposite.
Now, this is a handy way to do it. It matches what we've talked about so far. But let's try doing it a different way. We've figured out our x and y components of uh, our f1 and our f2. So we figured these out. We're going to use all of those. And now let's try it doing method two. So method two. Let's find the reactions for x and y right away. Or no movement in x and y. So we're going to give the stipulation that this can't be moving in X and it can't be moving in Y, which is really what we're trying to prove. We want to know what it takes for there to be no movement in X and no movement in Y. What we want, what we're saying is that the sum of the forces in the X direction will be zero and that the sum of the forces in the y direction will be zero. We know there's loads applied to this, so for this to be true, there must be an equal and opposite reaction, and we want to figure out what that is. So we want to know what it takes for the sum of the forces in the x direction to be zero and the sum of the forces in the y direction to be zero. So sum of the forces in the y direction to be zero, for this to be true, let's see what forces we've got. We already calculated that we had F1y of minus 1.88 kilonewtons, and we calculated F2y is minus 4.33 kilonewtons. But there's got to be some reaction that's keeping this from moving. Some reaction RY. We don't know what direction it's going in. I'm going to assume that it's acting in the positive direction. So I'm just going to add it in here. If I get a negative value, I'll know it was going in the opposite direction. It'll be go it was going downwards. So this is equal to zero. This is just a placeholder. I don't know what this is, but I want to know what reaction in the y direction stops this object from moving in the y direction. There's two loads applied to it in the y direction, but it's not moving and I need to figure out what that takes. I can rearrange this and I have, we move these over to the other side and they become positive. We have 1.88 plus 4.33. We have a reaction in the y direction of 6.21. Let's sum the forces in the x direction. And we know that everything in this direction is positive, so anything in this direction is negative. We solved for our x component here of minus 0.68, and then we solve for our x component here of plus 2.5, or minus 0 0.68 plus 2.5 kilonewtons, and then there's got to be some reaction here that stops this from moving, or we want to know what reaction we need to stop this from moving, and by stopping it from moving, the sum of all the forces have to be zero. If it's not zero, it's moving. So there's got to be something that's equal and opposite to these that's stopping it from moving. We can sum these up, and we get that Rx, we move these to the other side, this becomes negative and this becomes positive. We have 0.68 minus 2.5, and we get minus 1.82 kilonewtons. So it's moving, it's moving in the negative direction. Well, let's just take a look here. Our reaction was moving upwards and in the negative direction. So that seems to be holding true with what we did last time. Let's draw this reaction now. 
we have something with a component in the y direction of 6.21 kilonewtons and in the x direction of minus 1.82 kilonewtons. Do you notice I'm not drawing the negative here anymore because I've got an arrow that shows me it's negative. This is my reaction here. And here is my angle that I'm trying to solve for. We know that R has to equal the square root of the sum of the squares, or 1.82 squared plus 6.21 squared, or the square root of 1.82 squared plus 6.21 squared, or 6.47 kilonewtons. And we know that we can calculate this angle because it's going to be the inverse tangent of opposite over adjacent. Well, opposite is my ry, 6.21, and adjacent is 1.82. We want the in we want the inverse tangent of 6.21 divided by 1.82 or 73.67 degrees. So both of these ways we get the same value. We get the same force. So we figured out this is 6.47 kilonewtons. The arrows look similar and the values and the magnitude are the same. This is going to be a handy way to do it because we can keep things in uh, X and Y components right up until the last minute and then we solve for our reactions directly from that. So this is a really handy way to break forces down, sum them up into their X and Y components, figure out the reactions that we need in X and Y, and then if we want, we can figure out the total reaction. So let's take just a minute and talk about where these forces come from and how the reactions work. Because it's a little bit different for different types of forces. Remember, even when we were talking about earthquake, I said it was a little bit weird because, you know, we pretend our object is staying still and uh, other things are moving around it. Um, so weight and reaction. So weight is uh, what's pushing us down towards the ground. And this really comes from gravity. So force, remember, is mass times acceleration. A body, is a body at rest experiencing no force since it's not accelerating? Because we're not shooting to the center of the earth. Except we are. We are actually trying to force our way into the center of the earth. We aren't because the ground is pushing back at us. A body experiencing no force is still trying to accelerate to the center of the Earth at a rate of 9.806 meters per second squared, or gravity on Earth. This is the acceleration due to gravity. And this is where the term Newton comes from when we talk about Newton uh, uh, figuring out gravity, or at least not discovering, but learning to understand gravity. Therefore, a motionless body must be still held in place by a force equal to the mass times acceleration due to gravity of the object. So whatever our mass is, it's trying to go down into the center of the Earth at the value of the mass times acceleration. This is the reaction to weight. So what we're saying is, is our weight is our mass times acceleration due to gravity. And our reaction, or the reaction, is what's pushing back at our feet to stop us from going down into the center of the Earth. Remember, one Newton is one kilogram time, uh, one kilogram meter per second squared. So let's do, just for fun, a 
a quick example. I'm not even going to flip the screen. We're just going to keep this one very easy. So imagine Shannon is standing on the earth. Maybe on this particular day, I weigh 140 pounds. So the mass of Shannon is 140 pounds. We want to know what that is in kilograms because we're going to work in metric here. Um, and so we want to know my mass in kilograms. Just We can do it in Imperial, but the units, everything's a little bit different. And then pound can be force or mass in, uh, in the Imperial system. It's all very complicated. Let's switch it over to metric. We're going to be working in metric. So let's, let's turn this 140 pounds into kilograms. Well, one pound is 0.4536 kilograms or just under half of a kilogram. So we can figure out that me as 140 pounds is 63.5 kilograms. You kind of have a sense of that. You've probably done some conversions like this uh, throughout your life. Um, so something uh, around 140 pounds is just over, uh, 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 just under half of that value. So my mass is 63.5 kilograms. But I'm trying to shoot down into the center of the earth. And that is my weight. Our weight changes depending on what planet we're on. I know, how often are any of us gonna go to another planet? But on earth, our weight is based on the gravity for earth. Our, my mass stays the same no matter what, where I go in the universe. Uh, maybe a bit different in a black hole. I don't know. So weight is mass times acceleration. Acceleration on Earth, we call gravity for Earth. We know that it's 9.806 meters per second squared. We know my, my mass is 63.5 kilograms. So 63.5 times 9.806 meters per second squared gives us kilograms, meters per second square, which we know is newtons. So Shannon is, her weight is 623 newtons, or if we wanted to talk about it as kilonewtons, 0.623 kilonewtons. So Shannon with a mass of 140 pounds or 63.5 kilograms, those are equal to each other, is the same as the weight of Shannon on Earth being 0.623 kilonewtons. What if I uh, take a job with SpaceX and I end up on the moon? Um, or I join the Umbrella Academy and end up on the moon? So uh, the gravity on, moon, on the moon is 1.6 meters per second squared. It's a different acceleration into the center of the moon. My mass stays the same. I'm still 140 pounds, so that means I'm still 63.5 kilograms. But now my weight is mass times acceleration, and the acceleration on the moon is 1.6 meters per second squared, which makes my weight 103 newtons, or 0 0.1, 0 0.103 kilonewtons. So that's why you feel lighter on the moon. Not that we've experienced it, um, but that's why people will feel lighter on the moon. So what about wind and its reactions? Well, wind is really just air in motion. It's a fluid medium with mass. Wind has a mass. It's very, 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 very low mass, but it has mass. Wind causes a force when it interacts with the body, or a structure, which is what we're talking about, because the body must produce an acceleration on the air particles to move the air around them. So basically, for wind forces, the body doesn't accelerate. The body makes the wind mass accelerate around it. You're not going to need to know too much about this. I just want to give you a background on where it comes from. Earthquake. In an earthquake, the body is accelerated. So remember in wind, the body makes the wind accelerate around it. 
The earth moves and it takes the building along for the ride. The earth is exerting a force on the body which is causing it to move. To make it easier, we consider our reference point to move with the earth, which contextually makes it seem like the building is staying still or anchored to the ground and it's static, and we apply a load that is uh, uh, the acceleration um, caused by the earthquake, similar to gravity, which is why when we did our earthquake calculations, it was a percentage of gravity. It is saying that the ground is trying to accelerate our building with a force equivalent to percentage of gravity. Uh, so that's basically what I've summed up right here. This relationship is the accelerating acceleration produced by the earthquake, where the force of the acceleration is the mass of the body times the acceleration of the earthquake. And the acceleration of the earthquake, because the mass stays the same, will often relate as a percentage of gravity load. Pressure and reaction. We're not going to do any work with this, but just to kind of give you some information. When air or a fluid is held in a vessel, it's not in its natural state. It doesn't want to be there. This cup of water that I have, this water doesn't want to be here. If this cup wasn't here, the water would flatten out because it wants to get down into the center of the earth. This bit of water up here is higher than this bit of water down here. This is further away from the center of the earth than this, and it wants to be in the center of the earth. Uh, so for compressed air in a vessel, the particles are all trying to accelerate away from each other, and they'll create pressure on the object. For water in a glass, all the particles are trying to accelerate out and down to fall flat to get as close to the center of the earth as possible. To resist the particles accelerating out of the vessel, the vessel must exert a force on the fluid or air or liquid to maintain equilibrium. So this liquid has a force trying to push down and out because it wants to get down and get flat. So this cup is pushing back on that water. There, I just released some of the force on that cup. <clears throat> so let's do just two fun examples um, looking at uh, reactions with earthquake and wind. So we have an earthquake example where we're standing, someone's standing in their living room when the earthquake hits. The quake produces lateral acceleration equal to 15% of gravity. So it's trying to move you back and forth uh, with 15% of gravity. It's just after the holidays, so you're carrying a bit of extra weight, topping the scales at 85 kilograms. What is the reaction required for you to maintain equilibrium? And so we want a magnitude and a direction in kilonewtons that stops us from moving. Doesn't mean we can't sway, but what we don't want is our object to totally move position. So let's take a look at what we've got here. Let's do our earthquake example. So earthquake. We have um, a person and there is going to be a downward force and some amount of, well, what way am I drawing it in this? some amount of lateral force. And we want to know the earthquake force, or we want to know the reaction required to keep this person from moving. So we know that this is going to be the force acting downwards is going to be their weight. And that's going to be dependent on their mass. And this is the earthquake force. Now, luckily, those are nicely along principal axes. The weight down, well, this is similar to what we had been calculating before, but we're, they gave it to us in kilograms. We're used to seeing it in newtons or kilonewtons, so maybe we want to switch that into kilonewtons. It would probably be handy if we had that weight in kilonewtons. And we know weight is mass times gravity or acceleration due to gravity, and they said that we weigh 85 kilograms. And we know acceleration due to gravity 
is 9.806 meters per second square, which, if we plug this into our calculator, is 85 times 9.806, or 833.5 newtons. Kilograms, meters per second squared is newtons. But we often like to talk about things in kilonewtons, so 0 0.833 kilonewtons. So that is the force acting downwards. Earthquake, they told us, was going to be 15% of W. Or another way they said it was uh, mass times g, but 15% of g. Well, those are really the same thing. We could, we have 85 kilograms times 15% of 9.806 meters per second squared, or 85 times 15% of 9.806 meters per second squared, or 125 newtons, which is the same as 0 0.125 kilonewtons. So this W value here is 0 0.833 kilonewtons, and this E value is 0 0.125 kilonewtons. Now what they wanted to know was what reaction keeps this person from moving due to the earthquake. Not bending and swaying a little bit, but from actually physically moving entirely in space to another spot. We can sum these up and then find the reaction, or we can find the reactions to each of these and then sum these up. Let's try it by summing the forces in the y direction where we want everything upwards to be positive, well, we have minus 0 0.833 kilonewtons downward, plus some unknown reaction in the y direction. Our y is going to have to be 0.833 kilonewtons upwards. It came out positive so it's going to be upwards. We can sum the forces in the x direction, and we want to know what it takes for this object or person not to move, or what it takes for it to be zero, the sum of all the forces to be zero, and everything in that direction is positive. We've got 0 0.125 kilonewtons going in that direction, plus some unknown reaction that's got to be stopping this thing from moving. Well, our reaction in the x direction is going to be minus 0 0.125 kilonewtons. So we're saying that this person or this object is going to have, um, uh, we're going to have 0 0.833 kilonewtons upward and 0 0.125 kilonewtons in the negative x direction. We draw tip to tail here. Our total reaction we can figure out by using the square root of the sum of the squares where our reaction can be 0 0.833 squared plus 0 0.125 squared. So the square root of 0.833 squared plus 0.125 squared, or 0 0.842 kilonewtons. And we need to know in what direction it's going, or the angle relative to 
uh, the x-axis we know is going to be the inverse of the tangent of opposite over adjacent. Well, this is the angle we're worried about. Opposite is 0 0.833 divided by the adjacent side, which is 0 0.125. We have 0.833 divided by 0.125. We get 81.5 degrees. So we need a reaction, or the Earth needs to push back uh, upwards with 0.833, and then we need friction of some sort of 0.125 kilonewtons to stop us from moving, and the total of those is that reaction right there. And its location is at 81.5 degrees from the x-axis. So you can see that worked out here. In this example, I didn't find the reactions in x and y. I found the total force and then found the reactions. But the values are the same. It doesn't matter which way we do it, so it's the same as method one and method two when we were finding um, the reactions before. Uh, both ways work. You can sum it all up and then find the total reaction, or you can keep it in X and Y, find the X and Y reactions, and then sum it up. We have another example where a billboard is five meters high and 10 meters wide. It weighs 0.5 kPa and experience a wind load of 1.2 kPa. Calculate the reaction required to maintain equilibrium for the billboard. So let's draw ourselves a little diagram. I always find that handy here. Wind, they're saying we have a billboard that is five meters tall and 10 meters long, and that there's some wind load acting on it and some gravity load acting on it. They've given us the dead load or the weight load of 0 0.5 kPa and they've given us a wind pressure of 1.2 kPa. So they've given us a W and a wind pressure. Now remember, these values are in kPa, not kilonewtons. So this means every square meter has this many kilonewtons on it. So we're saying that that one meter by one meter area has 0.5 kilonewtons of dead load and 1.2 kilonewtons of wind load. And we've got that 10 by five times. So we're saying that our total values for W and P, or our weight, is 0 0.5 kPa times 10 meters times five meters or 25 kilonewtons. 10 times 5 is 50, and half of that is 25. And P is 1.2 kPa times 10 meters times 5 meters is 60 kilonewtons. So we have a downward force of 25 kilonewtons and a lateral force of 60 kilonewtons. So this is in our y direction and p is in our x direction. Let's sum the forces in the y direction with everything upwards being positive and we want to figure out what it takes to make sure this thing doesn't move or that the sum of all the forces in the y direction is zero. Well, we've got 25 kilonewtons acting downwards, 
and it doesn't look like we have anything else in the y direction, so we're going to have to have some y reaction. We don't know what its value is, but it looks like we can calculate it. For this thing not to move, there must be a y reaction of 25 kilonewtons. Let's sum the forces in the x direction. Well, we know we have 60 kilonewtons going in the positive direction, and we know that this thing doesn't move, so there must be some reaction from stopping it from moving. Or we need to figure out what reaction should be there to stop it from moving. We need to know what reaction in the x direction would balance out this 60 kilonewtons, or what, when we sum it all up, would equal zero so that this doesn't move. Well, our x equals 60 kilonewtons, or we need 60 kilonewtons of force pushing in the opposite direction to keep this from moving. Let's draw ourselves a little diagram here. We've got 25 kilonewtons going downwards and 60 kilonewtons going in this direction. So this is our Ry equals 25 kilonewtons and this is our Rx equals 60 kilonewtons and sorry look at that I drew that wrong let's redraw that we've got 25 kilonewtons going upwards so our y equals 25 kilonewtons and our rx is going in the negative direction our x equals 60 kilonewtons and that's going to be our total reaction that we need to determine right there. And we want to know what its magnitude and direction are. Well, magnitude is r equals the square root of 25 squared plus 60 squared, or the square root of 25 squared plus 60 squared equals 65 kilonewtons. And we need to know its direction. Uh, we need opposite over adjacent. 25 divided by 60. we get 22.62 degrees. So we need, basically let's redraw this. If this is some unknown object, we have some applied loads of 25 kilonewtons and 60 kilonewtons. And for this thing not to move, we need some reaction of 65 kilonewtons, that is 22.62 degrees from the x-axis. This is what it takes to make sure this object doesn't move due to these two loads, which is what we need to figure out. We want to know what it takes to make sure this thing doesn't move. So what did we learn today? We learned that statics means a system in equilibrium or not moving. We know that force equals mass times acceleration. Vectors have a magnitude and direction. Force is a vector that we're going to use a lot during this course. We need to know how to break a force into x and y components. We need to know how to determine magnitude and direction of a force. And we know that for it not to move, there needs to be an equal and opposite reaction. So that's part one of our statics course lecture. Next week, we're going to take this further because there's something else 
funny going on here. That person who had the earthquake acting on them, sorry guys, that person who had the earthquake acting on them, they had a force pushing on them and pushing them down into the ground. And we saw a reaction like that. But we know that that person wants to tip over during that earthquake. And so we're going to start exploring that phenomenon. That load wasn't applied at the ground perfectly. It was applied in the middle of their centroid, or the center of their personal uh, uh, centroid of, of weight or inertia. Um, and so they have a tendency to want to tip over. So it's not just about moving up and down and sliding back and forth. There's this idea of spinning around as well. And that is where moment comes into play. So next week, we're going to start to introduce this concept of moment, what it means, how we calculate it, and how we build this into this idea that something is static, that it doesn't move. Uh, and so next week, we're going to learn a lot of valuable things that are going to be super important in doing the last few lectures of the term. So these are some of my favorite topics to talk about. We're going to dig in to structures part two next week.